Welcome to Have You Heard, an IDF podcast. This podcast is a service of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, a nonprofit organization that improves the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency. People living with PI are the zebras of the medical world, and the IDF community is one big zebra herd. For people living with PI, it is crucial to advise state officials of the challenges and obstacles the rare disease community faces. Today, we will be exploring one such route for providing that education, Rare Disease Advisory Councils, or RDACs, and how you can engage with them and create a stronger voice for the PI community in your state government. All right, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode, IDF Advocate Connections, Becoming a Rare Disease Advisory Council member. I'm Jamie Sexton, Director of State Policy at IDF, and I'm happy to be your guest host for today's podcast episode. As part of IDF's mission, one of the ways to help our community overcome healthcare barriers is to focus on state and local healthcare issues. For those living with rare diseases, such as PI, it's important to have a strong voice in state government and advise policymakers on critical issues related to access, coverage, and the diseases themselves. Many state policymakers are unaware of the challenges the rare disease community faces. To help bridge these gaps in knowledge, Rare Disease Advisory Councils, or RDACs, are created. RDACs serve as an advising body and liaison between the rare disease community and state governments. They are extremely important to help enable communities to address certain barriers that prevent individuals with rare diseases from accessing care for their condition. With us today to discuss their work with RDACs in their states is a panel of IDF advocates, Jessica Goddard and Rachel Goddard from South Carolina and Marion First from Utah. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for being with us today. I'd like to start by having you introduce yourselves and tell our audience a little bit about your roles as IDF advocates. Marion, let's start with you. I am a retired patent attorney and I also worked on trademarks. And I moved to Salt Lake City in about 2005. And the reason I moved here was to pursue my interest in speed skating using the facility that was built for the 2002 Olympics. Before 2010, I was started getting sick a lot. And in 2010, I was diagnosed with CVID. And I joined IDF shortly after that. Um, I attended the National conference in Phoenix in 2011, and I was really impressed. And I was sort of dumbfounded when I realized that I was walking into a a room with more than a thousand people, almost all of whom were either patients or caregivers. I became a volunteer advocate in 2013, just in time for Advocacy Day that was held in conjunction with the National Conference in Baltimore. And Until then, I never imagined that I would ever do anything related to lobbying. That was just something I would not even have dreamt of. But I discovered that I actually like doing it. And in addition to going to Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill, either in person or the last couple of years virtually, I've also submitted um, written comments in support of the Utah Medicaid expansion. I've submitted written comments the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services against proposed rules. And I also testified at one legislative hearing here in Utah. That's wonderful. Thank you, Marion. Jessica, what about you? Do you want to share a little bit about yourself? Yes, definitely. So my name is Jessica Goddard, and I'm a current junior studying public health at the University of South Carolina. And I've been on my health journey since I was four years old, but was officially diagnosed with CBID when I was 13. And I began advocating with IDF when I was 16 years old. I started my work as a teen council member at several of the teen escapes and family weekends. I've led two walk teams for IDF and worked as a plasma awareness coordinator where I visited local plasma locations. But most recently, I have started my work as a health access advocate on both the state and national level. So on the national level, I've attended two of IDF's national advocacy days. And on the state level, I've been fortunate enough to work with the South Carolina government representing PI. Thank you, Jessica. And last but certainly not least, we're also joined by Rachel. Rachel, can you share a little bit about yourself? 
Sure. Um, I'm Rachel Goddard, parent of Jessica Goddard. Uh, once Jessica became involved in IDF as a member of Teen Council, I became involved along with her in joining IDF at the national um, conferences and advocacy days in Washington, as well as meeting with our local South Carolina reps and senators. Um, I've also attended the national conferences, family retreats, the walks, and teen escapes with Jessica over several years. And also just recently started leading co-hosting with Jessica, the South Carolina Get Connected group uh, that meets once a month online. And so one thing I, I've loved about being um, a parent attending these conferences is, you know, meeting parents of newly diagnosed patients since we've kind of been there, done that, and also reconnecting with all past IDF friends. Thank you all so much for that very impressive background information. Really appreciate you all joining us today. So I'd like to get started by asking if you can share a little bit about how you all got engaged with your state's RDACs. Uh, Jessica and Rachel, can you please share first? Yeah, so in early 2019, Jamie here was approached by members of NORD, so the National Organization for Rare Disorders, and other stakeholders to see if she knew of anyone in our state of South Carolina that would be interested in attending an initial planning meeting for establishing an RDAC in South Carolina. And since my mom and I were and are both active participants in IDAC um, activities in the national and local level, Jamie reached out to us and asked if we wanted to be involved and represent PI. And we were both really excited to be invited to attend these meetings. And so over the next two years, we attended several in-person and virtual meetings. Um, to go through this planning process. And it was a really great opportunity to be able to meet with representatives from other rare disease patient organizations, as well as um, meet with members of the medical and public health community as we planned our RDAC structure. And each meeting provided us with the opportunity to educate about primary immune deficiencies and the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Thank you for that information, Jessica. Rachel, anything you wanted to add to that? You know, Jessica and I um, shared stories and uh, and concerns, but from my perspective, it was a great opportunity to share concerns from a caregiver perspective. And the RDAC allows um, representatives both as a patient and as a caregiver as well. So it's it's a great opportunity to provide both perspectives. That's phenomenal. What a dynamic duo you two are. And Marion, what about you? Do you want to share a little bit about how you got engaged with your state's RDAC? I think it was about 2019 when Jamie contacted me about Nord and kind of put me in touch with them. And then in 2020, I received some information from Nord about a bill for an RDAC that was pending in the Utah legislature. And um, I really was not involved in getting that bill introduced or anything like that. But when I found out it was pending, I sent emails to everybody on the health committees in the House and the State Senate. And then when it passed out of the committees, I contacted my representative and my senator. And the bill did pass. I don't remember what the um, actual vote count was, but it passed pretty handily. And it was signed into law by the governor. And that was in 2020. But it wasn't funded until 2021. So again, in spring of 2021, I received a notice from Nord that they had a series of um, online presentations about getting RDAX going. And there was, I listened to one of those that seemed the most relevant. And they had somebody from the state health department involved because the Utah RDAC is run through the state health department. I'm not sure about other states. But I found out who the contact person was at the state health department and that they were at some point going to be accepting resumes for the various positions on the council. So I prepared a resume and sent it in and got an acknowledgement that they received it. And out of the blue, I got an email telling me that I had been selected. There was no interview, no request for references, no request for any additional information. Just I was accepted. And we had our first meeting in November. Um, there are 18 members total in the RDAC as it stands now. And that includes a couple of people from the Utah Health Department, 
some University of Utah doctors, a couple of people from a company that was contracted to administer the RDAC for the health department, and several other people who are either representatives of patient organizations or rare disease patients. That's wonderful. Thank you, Marion. Now, Marion, you are actually the first PI community member to secure a seat on a state RDAC. Congratulations, first and foremost. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about how you plan to use this new platform to bring awareness to PI? Well, I'm still kind of trying to figure out how things how things work with the RDAC, and I think everybody else is too. So um, we've only had one meeting on November 19th, and we were all tasked with reviewing draft bylaws and putting in our two cents worth, and also coming up with some suggestions for issues to be addressed and so that we can then prioritize them. And um, so I have done all of that. And I've, I've tried to come up with things that would be of interest or relevance for a broader spectrum than just the PI community, figuring that that's probably the best way to get things going. So um, among the things that I suggested are um, that we might want to address our um, insurance company cost sharing which could include copay accumulators, formulary restrictions and tier classifications, uh, coverage for treatments under major medical or pharmacy benefits, and non-coverage for experimental treatments when there is no FDA-approved treatment, which I have gathered is a big concern for some of the other rare disease people. Another thing that I have noticed here in Utah is that there is something of an issue with Medicare coverage for people who have Medicare on the basis of disability. And none of the Advantage plans offered in the state cover the 20% copay for Part B medications like immune globulin. And I suspect that's true for other Part B medications. There are only two supplement plans that are available for somebody who would opt to take regular Medicare and have Part B in a supplement. And I don't know anything about those plans. I don't know what the premiums are. And um, I don't know if there are any other issues with them that make them, you know, less desirable than the supplement plans that I can get into on the basis of age. And a third topic, and I don't know how well this is going to fly, is that since our purpose is, is to make recommendations to the legislature and other government agencies is to try to see if we can get the legislature and the attorney general's office to stop taking actions that are contrary to public health considerations and science. And I think this hurts probably almost everybody in the rare disease community. And it certainly hurts those of us with PI who feel kind of trapped in our houses. Thank you so much for sharing those concerns. I'm sure these are all um, very familiar to those of our community that are listening to this podcast right now. So thank you for raising those within your RDAC. So we're now going to shift to South Carolina. Jessica and Rachel, you both got involved with the effort to create an RDAC in your state at the very beginning stages. What initially attracted you to the effort and made you feel like it was something important for you to take part in on behalf of the PI community? Yeah, so as a patient with PI, it can be difficult to find doctors who are knowledgeable on PI in our state, as well as the complex autoimmune issues that we sometimes deal with that are associated at least with my particular PI, CBID. And while I've received great care over state lines, I'm frustrated with the lack of knowledge of PI in my local medical community. And additionally, many of the issues I've experienced, such as the necessity for rapid assessment and treatment in an emergency room environment, due to the nature of my immunodeficiency, are also experienced by other rare disease patients. And finally, the RDAC would provide an opportunity to connect with newly diagnosed patients with the appropriate organizations, such as IDF, and to assist the patients and their caregivers in navigating their diagnosis. Thank you so much, Jessica. Rachel, anything you wanted to add? Um, I would echo Jessica's words regarding connection between patients and organizations supporting their particular Um, concerns. IDF 
has personally been invaluable to our family. Education, connections, support, friendships, resources. Uh, we found IDF on our own after Jessica's diagnosis. Um, while navigating a medical system that doesn't understand your disease is frustrating, not having someone else to talk to that understands your journey is uh, adds more frustration and can be very lonely. So we're hoping that the RDAC can provide education about PI, but also connect um, patients who are newly diagnosed with any rare disease in our state with support organizations like IDF and those that would handle their particular diseases. Thank you so much for that, Rachel. We love to hear that IDF has been a, a valuable organization to you and your family. So now that we've talked about your interests and initial involvement with your state RDOCs, I'd like to know if you've faced any obstacles in your efforts to establish your state RDOCs and how you overcame those challenges. Rachel, I'd like to circle back to you on that one. Our first challenge in scheduling meetings uh, was getting a good representation of rare disease organizations who can attend. Uh, while not all groups could attend all the meetings, we had documentation updates provided electronically to all stakeholders so that ideas could be shared. It, it was difficult to get a good representation, attend a lunch meeting when everyone had their own um, you know, businesses to, to attend to. Second challenge was establishing and documenting the structure of the RDAC. Uh, we met with representatives of North Carolina who established our RDAC in 2015 and were very successful in establishing uh, their uh, committee. So they helped us draft the initial legislation. Uh, third problem was we need to secure a location to house the RDAC operation. Uh, that took some time. We met with representatives from the local university and the hospital, as well as the Department of Health to kind of quote unquote, sell them the idea of the RDAC and hopefully provide um, us with the ministry of support. Unfortunately, you know, our Department of Health was leaning towards uh, helping us and then COVID hit uh, literally within the month that we were talking to them about it. So uh, we introduced our legislation the week the world shut down, literally. So March of 2020. So we kind of were in hold, a holding pattern through summer of 2021. And I'll let Jessica continue the story. So, gratefully, the RRDAC for South Carolina was signed into law in July of 2021 as a part of the budget proviso and was housed at a major medical university in our state. And while we were originally informed that the public applications would be considered for positions on the council, specifically for patients and caregivers of patients with rare diseases, the RDAC committee positions were actually filled in winter 2021 by the medical university managing the council. And while we are currently unsure as of now who is on the committee and what rare diseases are represented, we have been told that a website will be established so that meeting minutes and public forums would be available. And hopefully um, my mom, Rachel, and I will be able to represent the PI community in that way. Thank you both very much. And how impressive to have uh, made this happen during a global pandemic. Uh, to get something like this passed at any point in time is challenging, but to have accomplished this during COVID is very impressive, and I hope you both uh, feel that. Uh, Marian, now to you. Uh, any obstacles that you face in your guys' efforts to establish the Utah RDAC? Um, I don't really know because I wasn't involved until it was already introduced in the legislature. And the way the Utah legislature works is it it meets for 45 days at the beginning of the year. And almost all of the legislation is worked on during the rest of the year and sort of put in line for consideration. And the, those 45 days are kind of a massive voting session. <laughs> um, the bills are already prepared. So I, I really wasn't involved and I really don't know who was involved except that a couple of the other RDAC members did mention having been involved in the effort, but I don't, I really don't know them. I haven't talked to them other than at that meeting. And it's interesting because the legislature claims to be very conservative and very fiscally responsible, and they still approve funding for this. And I, you know, I don't think there was really a lot of opposition in the legislature. 
Okay, thank you for that history, Mary. I appreciate that coming out of Utah. So we're gonna take a quick break and we'll talk some more with our PI advocates in just a few moments. The IDF Action Alert System is a tool used to mobilize our community on legislative issues related to primary immunodeficiency, or PI. A strong united voice from the PI community can influence public policy issues that impact the health and access to care of those with PI. Action Alerts urge individuals to contact their elected officials and other policymakers at critical times when a patient perspective is needed to remove barriers to care. Sign up for Action Alerts today to send messages directly to your policymakers and join others from the PI community in creating change. The sign-up page can be found at www.primaryimmune.org slash action dash alerts. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're joined by a panel of IDF advocates sharing their experiences and involvement advocating for and working with Rare Disease Advisory Councils, or RDACs, in their states. To continue the conversation further, I'd like to ask each of you for your advice. As you all know, every state's RDAC is a bit different, but do each of you have any general advice for ways PI community members living in states that have an RDAC can get engaged? Jessica, why don't we start with you? If there's an RDAC website, access the schedule of meetings and see if the public is allowed to attend. Second, I would advise writing to the RDAC and introducing yourself as a member of the PI community and the Immune Deficiency Foundation. And third, stay aware of openings in established RDAC councils. If public applications are accepted, apply to be a patient or caregiver representative of the PI community. Thank you, Jessica. Marian, what about you? You should be aware that Probably in every state, there are open records laws that apply and that the membership and their terms and the proceedings of the meetings are public record and accessible. So um, you can find out, you know, when the next appointments are are due to be made. And um, the other thing is you don't really have anything to lose by submitting an application if the opportunity arises. I found out at that meeting we had already had that all of the applicants were accepted. Wonderful insight, Mary, and thank you. And Rachel, what about you? Any additional advice? I would just say that if, um, if there is an RDAC in the state and uh, there is a Get Connected group through, um, you know, through the IDF as well to um, maybe join the meeting if you haven't already one one of the months and, and let the members know. Not everyone knows about the RDAX um, because it is a larger organization and, and use any of the tools that IDF has to inform any other um, IDF members. All phenomenal advice. Thank you very much for those. So now I'm going to ask the reverse of that question. As you all know, there are many states that have yet to create an RDAC. So what advice would you give community members in states that have not yet created their own RDAC? Rachel, why don't we start with you on that question? Um, I would say make sure you let IDF know that you want to be involved in local advocacy in your state. Contact your local chapter of NORD, as uh, that's the National Organization of Rare Disorders, uh, since they are the main organization spearheading the establishment of the state RDACs right now, each state has an individual state um, chapter of NORD as well. Uh, you don't need a large group to start a planning committee. I mean, at the end of the day, you can send an email to some of the larger organizations in your state, like hemophilia, sickle cell, you know, the Cancer Society, and reach out and say, hey, you know, you don't want to, you want to get together and have a meeting and Talk about all the concerns that rare diseases have that are common. Phenomenal advice. Thank you, Rachel. Marion, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, um, if you have, if you don't know what's going on in your state, I would recommend starting by going to the Nord website. And they have a web page where they uh, list the status of, of what's going on in all of, all of the states. So you can find out if your state already has a, an RDAC that's up and running, if there's something in the works or if nothing's been done yet. 
Wonderful. Great suggestion. And Jessica, you want to close this out? Any additional um, advice you would like to provide to community members? Definitely. So I think, especially as a young adult, so I started being involved with um, our RDAC coalition when I was 17. And I was a little out of my comfort zone, but it was a fantastic way to learn about state policy and other issues that are affecting other rare disease communities. So I just think that as a young person, don't feel intimidated by this, but rather use your resources and be proactive in your own research. And so like just mirroring what um, my mom and Marion said, just contacting Nord, contacting IDF. And even if you are aware of other rare disease organizations in your state, talk to them because it's impressive if you can help organize that as well and just being involved as someone in their young adult lifetime. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jessica. We really appreciate the unique perspective that you're bringing today as a young adult member of our community. So lastly, I'd like to close this out with a a little bit more general of a question. Before you all started your journey with your state's RDACs, you each volunteered with IDF in various capacities, including as advocates on Capitol Hill during IDF advocacy days and serving as health access advocates. What final words of wisdom would you like to share with PI community members who may be intimidated to get involved with advocacy? And uh, Mary, and I think we'll start with you. Okay. Well, at the beginning of this whole thing, I sort of would never have dreamed of doing advocacy work. It, and I found out a few things, and that not, not everybody who does this sort of thing is a highly paid person from some large corporation so, I mean, that my concept of, a, of what advocacy meant has changed a lot. IDF identifies the issues that they want, they want presented, certainly at the federal level, and they provide information about them and they provide training. So IDF gives you what you need. The issues that IDF selects are nonpartisan and they have gotten support from both sides of the aisle. The asks are reasonable. So nobody expects you to go and request something that is just totally off the wall. And IDF has been doing a pretty good job of getting things into legislation. And it's pretty satisfying to know that you had some part of it, even if it wasn't a huge part. And I've found that even the very conservative Utah representatives and senators um, have supported IDF's legislative asks. In fact, Senator Orrin Hatch made sure that the, our asks from 2018 made it into the must-pass budget bill. So, um, and it doesn't matter what your personal politics are. The issues that, that you talk to these people about really are nonpartisan. And I, I've found that, you know, I don't have to agree with the, the politicians on everything, but if I can get them to listen they usually will, or, and more often I talk to the staff people. Most of the legislative staffers and the representatives, if you happen to actually meet with one, are, they're easy to talk to, they're interested, they ask questions, and it's really not a traumatic experience at all. And the other thing is if they ask you a question and you don't know the answer, you can always refer them to IDF or tell them that you will find out the answer and get back to them. Thank you so much for sharing, Marian. I'm going to have to um, take that clip and create a commercial for IDF Advocacy Day out of it. <laughs> so Jessica, what about you? Uh, any advice you'd like to share as we close out today? Definitely. So advocacy is telling your story, and this can be done at any age and of any level of experience. You know your story and the struggles you have experienced throughout your healthcare journey. And advocacy doesn't have to involve technical issues or complicated medical jargon. It's sharing your experience and the story that is what people will remember when you explain why certain issues are important to you and to your rare disease community. Thank you, Jessica. And Rachel, final words of wisdom. Yeah, I would say that, you know, it was a little daunting to sign up for Advocacy Day the first time and you know, stand on the steps of of the Capitol building and know you're going in there to um, tell your story. But at the end of the day, you live your story every single day, either from a patient or a caregiver. And when you sit down, it is so easy to tell them 
your life. Tell them your concerns. Tell them the struggles you've had. But also at the same time, tell them what's worked. Tell them all the positive things that you've um, experienced with healthcare or support or, you know, there's, there's good things too, that good stories you can share as well that they will remember um, after meeting with them. Can I add something? Um, Absolutely, Miriam. Follow up on what Jessica said about, you know, you, you don't have to have make it complex or anything that you can just tell your story. The first advocacy day on Capitol Hill that I went to in 2013, there were two children in my group who were both born with skid and had successful bone marrow transplants. And they were children and they were like the hit of all of our meetings. You know, everybody liked talking to them and finding out how things were for them and that they were leading normal lives. It's a really wonderful point. You know, you can never start too early. We've, we've certainly had some, some very young adults that have come to uh, Capitol Hill and have been very successful at it. So thank you very much for hitting on that point, Marian. So thank you so much, Jessica, Rachel, and Marian, for sharing your experience and insights today. I'm looking forward to seeing your continued advocacy on behalf of the PI community and with your state RDACs. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. And a big thank you to you, our listeners, for being with us today. The Have You Heard podcast is part of IDF's work to empower the PI community through advocacy, education, and research. Continue to share this information and join us for more podcast episodes in the future as we explore the topics that mean the most to you. Until then, all of us here at IDF want to wish you good health and strength. And remember, the IDF community is rare and powerful. This podcast is a service of the Immune Deficiency Foundation. If you like our show and want to learn more, please subscribe to this podcast so future episodes will be sent to your device automatically. To learn more about primary immunodeficiency and the PI community, please visit the IDF website at www.primaryimmune.org. For more information on how to get engaged in advocacy on behalf of the PI community, check out IDF's Patient Advocacy Engagement Toolkit at www.primaryimmune.org slash patient dash engagement dash toolkit. And if you have a question you would like answered, email us at idf at primaryimmune.org. Thanks for tuning in.